audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Foundations. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the King, yeah. the Anointed One, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Foundations. Understanding the Jewish foundations of our Christian faith. With Robbo Robinson and Mandy Warby. In the last couple of programs, we've learned that while the word Christ means anointed one, it also directly means king. Christ mm. is our king, our sovereign. Royalty are very far removed from our normal relationships and acquaintances, but we've been adopted into the family of God, and now we have available to us a relationship with our King Himself. But what does that look like, and how are we supposed to incorporate that into our daily lives? It's a very interesting dynamic, actually, that we have a King. He's, as you said, He's royalty, He's our sovereign, He's our monarch, and we would never be casual or flippant toward an earthly king or monarch, yet we tend to be very casual when it comes to our accessibility to Christ our King. Mm. We tend to, um, I th- we mentioned this a, a couple of programs ago, we tend to humanize him a bit, mm. bring him down to our level so that we can relate to him. Um, and, of course, we we always like to um, talk about our rights and, and um, all of the blessings that come to us. So we tend to elevate ourselves a bit as well. Yeah. So we lift ourselves up, but we bring him down. I guess there is a bit of a paradox, though, because Jesus did say that we were friends and that you know, yes. we've been, as it says, we've been adopted into his into the family of God. So there is that careful balance that's got to be achieved within that. There is. There is a balance. But again, if you look at a human monarchy, um, you imagine that um, princes, um, Harry and William, I bet they have friends. I bet those friends still have to follow a protocol. Mm. I bet they're still respectful. I bet they're still behaving in um, in manner and ways that is um, appropriate when yep. dealing with royalty, even if they are mates and good friends with them. But we don't tend to do that. We don't tend to relate to Christ that way. We've made him so low that he's just become our buddy. But he's so much more than just our yeah. buddy. Now, John 20, verses 30 to 31 says this. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the King, yeah. the Anointed One, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Okay, so now, again, we, we learned that Christ means uh, the anointed one. We've said that, and it means Mashiach. That's the uh, Hebrew equivalent, which was Messiah. And in nearly all cases, Mashiach is talking about a king. Okay, so what did that king come to do? Well, he came to redeem us. He came as one of us. He lived a very humble life in spite of his royalty, in in spite of the fact that he's our sovereign. But he came to take our place to die for us, to pay for our, our sin, because... We couldn't do it on our own. So that makes him unique when it comes to um, uh, the role of royalty. If you look at at the role of royalty in human history, they were there to look after, to care for, protect their people, their, um, their subjects, to make sure that their borders were safe. But they always elevated themselves. The difference with our king is that he came to do all of those things, but he did it by humbling himself. So I think we we tend to want to keep him humble. (laughs) We we kind of take that a little bit too far. But our allegiance is not to a peasant anymore. He's not a pauper anymore. He's now at the right hand of the father. So we have to keep that in mind. He is the king of kings and our allegiance has to be to him. So what is our response to be when we're confronted with this truth about the fact that he can't, or that everything that was written about him is limited? There's so much more that he did that could have been written. In fact, John said in another passage, he said the whole world mm. couldn't even contain everything that he did. So how are we supposed to respond to him? Okay, now just quickly, there are a lot of ancient books that could have been included in the biblical canon that weren't. 
And there is very strict uh, criteria for what books were included and what books were not included. And it's important for us to understand why that is, but suffice to say that's not, not we're not going into detail about that in this program, but the Bible is very reliable, true and trustworthy, and we I think we covered that in some of our first uh, programs on foundations. But because there's this this you know difficulty that some people have with it, they kind of think that maybe the Bible's not reliable, but it is. Now, the writers of the New Covenant wrote, um, that it was necessary for individuals to believe in Christ. That's what John wrote that we just read about in uh, John 20. We have to believe in him as our king. Now, right at the outset, it's important that, again, we need to understand these technicalities about the Bible. They're, they're miraculous. These 66 books that were written over thousands of years by so many different authors, and yet they are all completely harmonised with each other. These were people who had most of them hadn't even met. Mm. It's it's really quite remarkable. But there's something that John stressed in John 20 that I just read in verses 30 to 31. He said, "These things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing this that He's the King." That's where you get life in his name. Mm. So I guess that begs the question, what does believing really mean? Exactly. And again, it's getting your head around who he is. If, if you, and and I'm, I want to emphasize again, if you treat him so casually, then you behave casually toward him. You, if you think that he's, he's so... He's so easy going, then he can sort of blink or look the other way when it comes to sin. Mm. I don't even know if I'm explaining myself rightly, but if you have a high estimation of him, a high reverence for him, that is going to be reflected in in you and I, this, yeah. how we treat him. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's kind of like the old saying that familiarity breeds contempt. Oh, you, know, you yes. become so familiar that like, you just you know, become contemptuous towards the, the real uh, place that he holds as our king. You're absolutely right. That's absolutely key to this. We are so familiar with him. And again, as I said, we, we've humanized him. We tend to deify ourselves a little bit because we have all the rights and blessings mm. and we're king's kids and we are the head and not below. And, you know, we can quote all those scriptures for ourselves. We elevate ourselves, but we humanize him when we shouldn't. He is fully human. This is the, the hypostatic union that we talk about. He's fully man. But he is fully God, yeah. and we always tend to forget about that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We focus on his humanity. Now, John twenty one twenty five. I, I touched on this before. It says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the whole world would not contain the books that would be written. The thing is, they weren't written down. We don't need those things. What we need to understand is who he is. Yeah. In how he's been revealed in Scripture, you know, we, we want the supernatural, we want the exciting, we want the additional stuff, the secret stuff. If God wanted us to know those things, he would have told us. Mm. It'd be in his word. Yeah. We are supposed to learn about what has been revealed and focus on that and respect him as our Mashiach, our king, and come to him accordingly. Now, again, we, we're learning Christ is the anointed one, the Mashiach, the Messiah, the king. So believing in Christ is all about the authority that he has. Now, remember that the authority that he has was very unusual at his time. He, he spoke with authority that left people marveling. I want to just quickly read a definition of what the of what Wikipedia says is the divine right of kings, okay? The divine right of kings, divine right of God's mandate is a political and religious doctrine of royal political legitimacy and it asserts that a monarch is subject to no earthly authority deriving the right to rule directly from the will of God and it goes on from there. So if 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 a king has the divine right given him by God and is subject to no earthly ruler, then what does that mean for us? How do you respond to a king? You respond with reverence and honor and might I even say in, in the case of Jesus, 
with absolute awe rather than flippancy or casualness. So it starts to paint a picture for us of uh, what it means to know our King and how we approach Him. And in the next program, we're going to look more at what's required of us in our relationship with our King. This has been Foundations, a look at the Jewish foundations of our Christian faith. For study notes, resources and more, see vision.org.au slash foundations. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au. 